Uh, thank you guys all so much for coming tonight. So the file I want to show you first is the final project guidelines and rubric. Now this is um, obviously for the entire final project. And right now we're going to spend most of our time tonight uh, talking about the first milestone, which is what you're going to be working on for your Sunday submission. Um, but it's always important to keep the end in mind. Um, and I really want to reiterate to everybody that your milestone is really just a portion of your final project. So like when an author writes a book and they write a chapter or so at a time to give to their editor to review, this is what you're doing with your milestones. So consider a milestone, a piece of that. You're giving it to your teacher, like an author to their editor, for them to review and give some feedback before the final submission. Some people are saying it's very hard to hear. Okay. Let me readjust myself. Is this better, the audio? All right, is the audio better now? Okay, great. Not better. Okay, uh, sounds like most people can hear okay. If you're having any issues, uh, sometimes logging out and logging back in does the trick. But either way, it's going to be recorded so you can watch it tomorrow once it's shared um, in your sections. All right, so we're going to just quickly take a look at this document, the final project guidelines and rubric. We're not going to spend too much time in it. Again, I just want to make sure that everyone understands how the milestone that you're working on for this week fits into the overall project. So this is available in your course under the assign, assignment guidelines and rubrics area, which you can find through a couple of places, but the easiest place to find it is in the Start Here tab in your Brightspace environment. So I want to scroll down to where it gives an outline of the paper. So here's an outline of the entire paper that you're going to be writing. So you'll notice that there are six sections. Um, the introduction, the supply and demand conditions section, the price elasticity of demand section, the cost of production section, the overall market section, and the last section recommendation. So the first section, introduction, is the only one that you're going to be submitting for the first milestone. Um, it's, two, it's two elements, two graded elements. You'll see under uh, Roman numeral one, there's an A and a B. So those are the two items that you're going to be graded on in that section. Um, and of course, your the writing component of the grade, which um, all of our rubrics have, just like our discussion board rubric. And then in future milestones, you're going to cover the rest of the sections. So the second milestone you do will cover sections two and three. And the third milestone you do will cover sections four, five, and six. And then if you continue to scroll down, you'll see some, some notes about milestone one, two, and three which we've just talked about, and some information about when they're due. So this first milestone is due in Module 2. And then lastly, you'll see the final project rubric. Now this is how you're going to be graded in Week 7 on the final project with everything put together. So I do encourage you to read, to read this, for, at least for the two um, items that you're going to be graded on. Um, but one thing I want to point out is that the exemplary column we don't have uh, for the milestones. So you do not need to reach the exemplary column that you see here for each of the critical elements on the milestones, but you can certainly work towards that. Um, so just keep that in mind as you do your writing, not just on this milestone, but on future milestones as well. All right, any questions about the overall project before we get into some specifics about the milestone? Yes, so Sophia, the first milestone is just the introduction section. Yep. 
So Donna, um, the student who included the abstract um, did so because in APA papers, that's sort of the standard. Um, it's not required on this paper simply because there's no critical element attached to it. Um, and we found that it, it makes more sense in this, you know, this, the course being at the level that it is to focus on the other components of the paper and not require an abstract. Um, but if you saw it on the sample paper, that was just a choice the student made. You are more than welcome to include an abstract, but you just won't be graded on it. So Diane asks, so we are just writing a thesis statement, history, and overview. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the gist of it, Diane. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll go through it in a bit more detail through the guide. Um, but yes, uh, th this is a, a fairly brief milestone. Like I said, it's just one section, which includes two graded critical elements. Um, it's a nice way to get your feet wet with the project. Um, it definitely makes sure that you've selected a company. And I see some, some students asking about that in the chat. So Ideally, you would have emailed your instructor your company choice by the end of week one. Um, if you haven't done that yet, um, please do that as soon as you can. We, we have a list of suggested companies. Um, we suggest these ones because we know that they work well for the analysis you're going to have to do. You don't have to pick from that list, certainly. Uh, we want you to pick something that you're interested in because that's going to make your work here a lot more enjoyable. But at the same time, we don't want you to pick a company that's not a good fit for this project. There are some where the analysis is just more difficult, and we don't want to put you in a position to not to not succeed on the paper or to make your life much more difficult. So if you're picking something not on that list, or if you're interested in a company not on that list, um, you'll need approval from your instructor. All right, just making sure I'm up with the chat. We have um, we have a handful of instructors on the line with us. So um, I've seen Rick and Rick Washick and Ellen Sloss and Kiara Yates are all uh, fellow instructors here at SNU teaching our um, Eco 201 and 202 courses. So thank you guys for helping me out in the chat. I'm, I'm sure there's more that I might have missed. So any faculty that I missed, I just I haven't seen your names pop up. So um, Faith asks, will we need a cover page and reference page for each paper, correct? Um, so yeah, a title page uh, in APA format um, is required. You can just keep the same title page that's for your paper. Remember, you don't, you don't necessarily have to have a, a title page that says milestone one. You can just treat it like it's your whole paper. Um, so the title page, whatever you want to title your paper, um, it can... You can change it later on if you want to get come up with something more clever once you've written your whole paper by week seven. But um, you're free to do that. And then, yes, you're always going to have to have a reference page. Um, it's going to be an APA format, your reference listings. And remember to start that on its own page. Um, so, Kyle, there's a lot of uh, resources available to you for APA. Um, in our class, there is a, in the learning modules area, there's a, a tab. So, you know, you have your tabs for all the modules, one through eight, and then there's also a module tab for APA resources. Um, the Writing Center has tons of resources for APA. The Shapiro Library has lots of resources for APA. And of course, there's just the internet, <laughs> um, which in some ways can be the easiest way to help you with making sure that your citations are correct and your, uh, your in-text citations are correct and your corresponding references are correct. But um, the, the items we have available in the course in that APA tab um, go over everything from the formatting of the paper to the references and citations as well. So I see a couple questions popping up. So Donna asks, is it okay to continue building and submit the same paper with the additional information for each milestone? Yes, Donna. Some, a lot of students do that. They just create one running paper. Um, the only thing I like to remind students of is, so let's say for this milestone, you submit it. 
um, you get some feedback from your instructor, you make some changes, milestone two comes, you add to the same document, you know, you're in a Word document, and then you submit it again for milestone two. Your instructor is not at that point in time going to be going back to read any edits that you made in, for the first section, the stuff that was part of milestone one. Um, so just keep that in mind. I, I just don't want anyone to be expecting feedback a second time on stuff they've already submitted until the, the final draft is due in week seven. Um, so Fermin asks about the reference for our ebook. That is a good question. I know that in the syllabus it lists um, you know, all the publisher information for the book. Um, but it sounds like Greg has a, a better, an even better answer for you, for me. All right, I'm going to make sure, there's a lot of questions, so I want to make sure I haven't missed anybody up in the chat. Looks like we're okay. And um, fellow faculty on the line, if I've missed anything, just feel free to type it in again so I address it for the larger group. Sure, Sophia, you said you have a question? You can go ahead and type that in the chat. Oh, <laughs> sorry if you forgot it. Well, in the meantime, um, it doesn't look like there's any questions specific to the overall final project. So I'm going to switch over to our guide. Um, yeah, that's a great question, Sophia. I think the, the easiest way to go about it is to think about um, companies and products that, that sell to consumers. Um, they don't, a company that doesn't sell to a too big a variety of products um, that they make their own product or service. So not, some students still pick it, but I, su I personally suggest against it, not a retail company. I think the analysis is more difficult. Um, yeah, and, and where the market is easy to define. So um, a banks, a lot of students like want to do banks, but they're more difficult because a lot of their business is to other businesses, so it's hard to do some of the analysis to get the information that you need. Um, so those those can be challenging. Uh, healthcare companies can also be challenging because there's not a lot of um, knowledge about about pricing, you know, because of health insurance, and so that that kind of makes the market a little bit different than just say buying a Coca Cola. Um, it depends on what you mean by an organic food company, like a farm that's organic or like a processed food company. Um, Annie's, if it, it also has to be publicly traded. I don't know if Annie's is publicly traded off the top of my head. Um, so the Annie's food company. So yeah, I'd be sure to check about that. A lot of brands that you see in stores are owned by other companies often. So that's something to keep in mind too. Yeah, so thank you, Greg. So Greg says that Annie's is owned by General Mills. So you could potentially do a company like General Mills, um, and that's, that is doable. They just have a very wide variety of products. So you might find yourself having to do more analysis than if you did a company like Netflix, which has pretty much just the one service. Mm. But, you know, I actually I have uh, a list of other companies that we've talked about um, adding. So Hasbro um, is another good choice that's not on our list. Mattel, um, Campbell Soup, Estee Lauder, and Avon, two makeup companies that would fit. Um, Constellation, that's uh, Spirits, Beer, Wine and Spirits company. U.S. Steel might be a good choice. Harley-Davidson, Levi's. Coach, the handbags, uh, Marriott, I've had students have success with. Um, Electronic Arts, that's a gaming company. Um, American Eagle Outfitters, Monster Beverages. Uh, 
Whirlpool, Goodyear, those are some choices. Yeah, um, so Yolan asks about P&G. I assume you mean Procter & Gamble. Proc oh, they just bought Gillette. Procter & Gamble is, a, is another very, very, very large company. They sell a lot of different products in a lot of different industries. So it just makes the analysis more because you have a big part of this project is we're going to be looking at the overall industry. So like if you're if you pick General Motors, you'd be looking at the in you know the car the market for automobiles. Um, but Procter and Gamble is in many different markets. So it makes your analysis just that much longer. So yeah, Boston Beer Company is is the company. Their their main brand is Sam Adams, but they're on the suggested companies list, so. Um, a lot of great questions about the company choice. This is it's really important because picking the right company that makes that makes your job easier and that keeps you interested and engaged in your work is is very important. So keep them coming. Yeah, White Wave. I'm not familiar with that company, but it looks like some folks are helping out on that one. So all hands on deck here. I love it. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Um, okay, Sophia. Yeah, that I I personally find it more difficult when a company has a lot of subsidiaries, especially when those subsidiaries are in lots of different markets. So, you know, different kinds of products that that don't have anything to do with each other. Because when you're when you're going to do your analysis, you're going to have to look at things like demand for that product. So, like demand for automobiles is an easy thing to research and it's just one thing to look at but if you have to research demand for lots of different kinds of products it just makes your job more difficult yes sophia png and general mills are like are like that which is why they're not on the list i might approve them if i were the faculty but i would warn a student about what they're getting themselves into yeah ups would be a good one yeah So um, the company listing is in your is in all your courses, your um, your Eco 201 course in Brightspace. You'll find it um, in the Start Here section. So if you go to Start Here and then you scroll down, you'll find um, a link to Final Project Resources, and it's there. Um, Fermin, I'm not sure if Anheuser-Busch is actually U.S. owned, so I might not approve it, um, but I'd, I'd have to double check. Yeah, that's the reason that we have Sam Adams or Boston Beer Company on the list instead of like an AB InBev. Um, they've had a lot of mergers lately, so they're kind of um, they're kind of big in that sense, and I don't know if they meet the more strict parameters for the company choice, but definitely talk with your instructor about it. So I'm just pulling up the, the guide for the final paper so we can talk about your two graded elements. Um, bear with me. Now, this guide that I'm showing you might have a, a few slight differences from the one that you see in your course, um, only because we've very recently updated it, um, but after the courses were built for this term. Nothing major, just, just letting you all know. 
Um, actually, no, this is the this is the one that's in your course, so this should be all set. Um, all right, so we still have plenty of time. So this is the final paper guide. So this is found in the same place that I just described. So if you go to start here and you go to final project resources, you'll see um, a handful of links to documents to help you with your um, with your work. So this is the final paper guide. This goes through the entire paper describing how to achieve each of the critical elements that you're going to be graded on. Um, there's a sample paper there, which one, someone um, in our chat already brought up. That's done on Hershey Company. And then there's a suggested companies list. And then we've got some older um, 10Ks or annual reports for the suggested companies to get you started. Definitely find the most recent one. Now that we're in 2018, um, a lot of definitely 2016 annual reports are out there, of course. And some companies might have 2017, depending on when their um, fiscal year ended. So um, here's a, a basic title page that you would obviously personalize. And then you'll see that we don't include an abstract anymore here. So that's not included, but if you'd like to to practice writing one, that's great. And then this is how your paper is going to begin. You'll have the title of your paper at the top of your first content page. And then this just goes through some basics of APA style. It's, you know, it's got to be in Times New Roman, and this is all laid out in the final project document. And then you're going to go through the purpose of your paper. So this is basically saying what, what your paper is going to do. You won't be able to write a full conclusion yet um, because you haven't done all your research yet. So right now it might feel like it's going to be a little bit vague, um, at least your thesis statement. But once you're done writing the whole paper, you'll be able to come back here for your final draft and say, and work in your actual recommendation to the company. You know, you're going to suggest they do X, Y, and Z, and that's that's basically the purpose of your paper, to say, this is what they should do, and I'm going to show you why. Um, so there's some, some writing help in our, um, we have a SNU YouTube channel, I'm sorry, an ECO channel, just for um, this course and the ECO 202 course, that has some, some links to videos on, on how to write a really great introduction paragraph that has a hook and then um, gives some, a very brief amount of background information, and then goes into that thesis statement. Um, so this section is going to be about half the first page, a paragraph or two. And then the second element is the history and overview of the company. So this is pretty straightforward for, for most students. Um, you can get all this information from, usually from the company website um, and from their annual report. So you'll want to give uh, a decent overview of how the company got started, what kind of products they were making or services they were offering when they first began, um, what their operations looked like. Uh, you know, sometimes companies start very small, someone's basement type of story, and then show how they grow and how they changed as time went on in terms of what products they offered. Um, and then give an overview of what their business looks like now, um, where they're operating, where they're selling, what they're making, things like that. So this section combined with the introduction, with the introductory paragraph, is usually between one and a half and two pages total of writing. So if you don't go on to the second page, you definitely don't have enough information, usually in your history and overview of the company section. Yeah, Ellen, that's um that's a great that's a great point. And you know, let me um this will probably be even more beneficial for the next milestone, but I can share it with you all now since I don't see a ton of questions specific to these elements or to the guide. But I'm going to pull up one of our um, one of the annual reports and point out some stuff here for you all. Okay, so I'm going to pull up the Hershey one. Um, Yep, so Sophia, to find the final project resources, go to start here and then scroll down to final project resources. So 
here's the Hershey Company. Oh, you know what? This isn't this isn't the best example. Um, yep, I want one that has a table of contents at the start. Let me pick a different one. Bear with me here, guys. It'll be worth it. <laughs> I promise. What? Yeah, maybe this one will be a good choice. So this company, Cure Green Mountain, is no longer a publicly traded company. So, um, you know, the, they make the K-Cups and stuff. Um, they used to be on our list. They're not on our list anymore since they're not a public company anymore. But that's what I'm going to see if that uh, an old annual report can be a good example for us. Yeah, it's it's loading. <laughs> All right. Uh, here we go. All right. So most of these annual reports, also called 10Ks, they, they follow the same um, outline. And this is what we see here. So this is the table of contents. So you'll see all of them begin with the first item is business and the second item is risk factors. That is where you're going to read the most about what's going on with the company. And then selected financial data is where you're going to find things like revenue and cost stuff. But if you just want to get to know what's going on in their business and what's going on in the industry overall, business and risk factors are the places where you're going to spend the most time just reading to get to know about the company. Um, I think it's a great idea to read this not just for one year, but to read it for a, a couple of different years to see how things are moving and what trends you might be able to identify. So Angela asks um, or states that she needs assistance about what types of questions should be answered in the introduction. So Angela, an introduction is, is very, I don't want to say scripted, but um, they, it follows the same, the same pattern, whether you're writing about economics or whether you're writing um, about in, a, in an English course. The introduction to a research paper like this where you're making a thesis statement, um, again, you're not going to be able to have you might not have a very detailed thesis statement since you haven't done all your analysis and might not know exactly your conclusions, but you do know that you're going to analyze the company and you're going to make some specific recommendations for how they can be profitable. That's all spelled out for you in the final project document. So you know in general what you're going to do, you just don't know the specifics of it yet. So if it's vague now, that's okay. Um, but it's always a good idea to start your introduction with some sort of hook and like I said, we have um, some videos on our YouTube channel. Ellen, if you want to share the link to our YouTube channel, <laughs> that's your cue. Uh, you, can, you can check those out. And the Writing Center uh, is especially well equipped to help with, um, with that portion of your paper. Yeah, Kyle, so this, the formula, it's, I think it's three steps that are included in any good introduction paragraph. Um, and that's in the YouTube video on our channel. There it is. So if you guys, you know, obviously you don't all have to go right now. <laughs> it's about 9 o'clock, so it's almost time for us to switch over to our Eco 202 folks. Um, that There's a video in there about um, writing an introduction paragraph that will help. All right. So Nora, um, you would follow the the typical APA guidelines for citing an annual report. You can go through, you know, um, if you Google that or or look through the materials on APA, you should be able to find that through the materials that are available. That 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 kind of stuff is cited all the time, so it's um it should be easy to find. Yeah, lots of lots of great APA resources out there. Okay, we are one minute over, so if anybody has any last burning questions, I definitely want to answer them before we move over to 202. You're welcome all.
Looks like there was one question that might have been buried. Um, Sophia, the example that I'm showing right now, is it just an annual report from a, a company that's no longer publicly traded? So you won't see this annual report, but you'll see annual reports for other companies. And the final paper guide that I showed um, a moment ago is in, in all the Brightspace courses, yes. And if you have any problems finding anything within the course or in your research in general, please just email your instructor uh, and they'll, they'll be more than happy to guide you. All right. Thank you guys so much. All right. So we are moving over to 202. Thank you, 202 students, for joining us tonight. I'm just going to move to our documents them up for us and we will get started. Let's see if this is the right one. Nope. We will review this one, but I actually want to start with our rubric first before we jump into the guide. Um, so the guide is where we're going to spend most of our time. We have a guide that shows you how to how to tackle basically each of the critical elements that you're going to be graded on, each piece that you have to include in your presentation. Here it is. All right, so that should pull up in a moment. So a lot of you might have already taken 201, Eco 201. Um, and if you have, you'll notice that this course is set up much the same as Eco 201. So and if you haven't taken the Eco 201, then um, this, will, this will help explain uh, how, how things are set up. So you have a final project due in this course in week seven. But you will also have milestones that are basically chunks of that final project due throughout the term. So your first one, of course, is due this week, milestone one, which is why we're all here to review milestone one. And then milestone two will be due in week four and milestone three due in week five. And then you'll find your final project submission will be due in week seven. So what you're going to see here is how, how each of the milestones are broken down and how they fit into the overall final project. So these are, again, they're just, each milestone is just a chunk of the final project. So as you're working on your milestone, you're really working on your final project. So please keep that in mind as you do your work. Um, the more work, the more time and effort you put into your milestone, probably the less editing you're going to have to do for the final project. Um, if you do it, if you do a phenomenal job on all of your milestones, you might not have to do really any editing, and then you're just done. So that's that's something to to aim for. Hi, John. Um, the participants don't have mic rights just because we have such a large group of students. Um, so if you have a question, you can just feel free to type it in the chat. Hopefully, you can hear me though. And we do have some instructors on the line um, in the chat helping me keep up with all your great questions. So, great. So I, I definitely recommend that everybody read through this, even though technically the final project is not due until week seven. Um, since you are working on it, every time you work on a milestone, you really should have an understanding of how everything fits together. We're not gonna read through this right now. You can do that on your, you know, by yourself when, when you've got time. But if you haven't done so already, read through this carefully. I'm just going to point out while we're here together and answer any questions you might have about it, um, the outline. So the outline basically tells you exactly what things you need to cover in your presentation. So it's a PowerPoint presentation. You've selected uh, a 10-year time period. Everyone's already done that because that was part of your week one discussion. So 
you're going to be looking at macroeconomic data for your 10-year time period. Um, you're going to be analyzing that in terms of major events that happened during the time. Um, you're also going to be looking at government policies, so fiscal and monetary policy. That'll come later in the term. And you're going to be looking at um, international trade as well. So in your outline, you'll see there's the first section is called examination of macroeconomic data. And there's quite a few items under this section. Most of these are going to be part of your first milestone. So um, 1A, so Roman numeral 1A, B, and C are all part of your uh, milestone 1. The only thing that's not included in milestone 1 is 1D on foreign trade. We don't cover foreign trade until week 6 of the course. So we wouldn't expect you um, to have to include that here yet. So you're just covering um, section 1, A, B, C for your first milestone. And then the second milestone will cover fiscal policy, which we see in section 2A. The third milestone will be section 2B. And then your final project will include everything and anything that wasn't already included. So Marie asks, um, growth rates and trends, are they meaning like expansion and recession? Uh, yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. So these are the kinds of terms that you are getting used to this week as we study GDP, unemployment, and inflation um, that help us explain. So if you were to look at a graph of GDP rates, say, okay, well, is up good or is up bad? <laughs> um, if you didn't know what GDP meant, you, you wouldn't know, just like, Unemployment um, up is not what we want to see. We don't want to see the unemployment rate going up, but we do want to see the GDP growth rate growing up, going up. So your ability to explain that is some of what um, your instructor is looking for here. And we'll get into that a little bit more once we get into the guide. Um, but I just want to make sure everyone can sort of see the big picture of your project and how um, this milestone fits into that. And then the only other thing I want to point out here before we jump into the guide is the rubric. So if we scroll down, you'll see how you're going to be graded on the final project. Um, so the difference here is that you have, we have an exemplary column, which means you've done exemplary work demonstrating that particular critical element. For your milestone, the highest achievement is proficient um, because it's your first draft. So keep that in mind as you do your work. You can absolutely try and achieve exemplary right now um, in your milestone work. Like I said, if you do a really phenomenal job on your milestone, um, you might not have to make any edits for the final draft. But if you're at proficient on your milestone, that's our expectation. But then it might mean you still need to make improvements to get to exemplary for the final. So I encourage students to look here, see, see the difference between proficient for each of these critical elements and exemplary and how to reach each one of them, um, just so you have that end in mind. All right. And you can read each of them. Um, again, we're not... Your milestone is only covering a few of these critical elements, not all of them. These are all of them for the entire final paper. Oh, Anne asks, what is meant by speaker notes? That's a great question, Anne. <laughs> so when you open up a PowerPoint file, what you'll notice is that underneath the slide area is um, a section where it says, click, click here for notes. No, what does it say exactly, Ellen? Jeez. I have to open up a PowerPoint. Um, but there is a video, I believe there's a video still shared in the course that shows you um, how to add speaker notes. And yeah, it says click to add notes, how to add speaker notes, and then how to, um, how to save it as a PDF to submit it so that your instructor can see the notes and the slide at the same time. That's not necessarily required, but it does make, um, it does make the grading go faster for them. So, you know what, I can 
Let me see if I can share my screen and show that really quick in case people don't know how to access it. Okay. Let's see. While I'm sharing my screen, I won't be able to see the chat. So um, if there's any questions, Ellen and company will have to save me. All right. Am I sharing my screen? Does anybody see a blank PowerPoint presentation? I don't think I am. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if it's working. Hmm. If I share a PowerPoint presentation on the, on the actual screen, then you won't. Um... You won't actually see how to, how to edit it. Oh, bummer. Well, um, if, if, you, if anybody is having trouble figuring out how to get to where the speaker notes are when you're working in PowerPoint, there's like a thousand YouTube videos. So you, you can just um, Google a YouTube video and, and something will pop up if you're having any difficulty. Sorry about that, guys. All right, so um, we are going to go to the guide. Now. And this is available in your course. So this course has a lot of um, data resources that you're going to need um, because, like we just saw, a lot of this presentation is looking at macroeconomic data. So we want to make sure that you're getting um, accurate macroeconomic data to include in your presentation. Oop. taking a little while to upload the PowerPoint. So to, get, to access um, the links that we've provided you guys to all of like the ma these macroeconomic databases, um, you go to start here in the Brightspace area under learning modules. And then you go to assignment guidelines and rubrics. And it's in the assignment guidelines and rubrics area. And Ellen, you'll notice we got a cool new template. <laughs> so yeah, well, um, oh, it's such a bummer that it won't let me share my actual um, screen. It's just letting me share files. But um, we have some great video resources on how to use um, FRED. So FRED stands for Federal Reserve Economic Database, um, which is sort of the a central place for you to find almost all the macroeconomic data that you're going to need for this project. Um, they're not the ones who actually make the data, so a lot of this data will come from places like the Bureau of Labor um, or the Census Bureau. Um, places like that are the ones who actually aggregate a lot of the data, but Fred um, puts it all together in these really easy to use graphs. Um, so that's really the one-stop shop, and we have the link to them um, in our SNU Eco channel. There's some links to their videos, and then in the final project resource area that I just mentioned um, is the link to Fred, and in the presentation I'm about to show you. So, lots of uh, lots of ways to access it. So, uh, your presentation is going to have a, a title page or a title slide, rather. Yeah, so FRED is an acronym, Federal Reserve Economic Database. Um, so this is a, a SNU provided template. You don't, you don't have to use a SNU provided template. <laughs> um, there is one, and the one I'm using is updated. We all, employees of SNU just got an updated template um, for the new year. Your courses were built before the new year, so your, your template's going to look a little bit different, but the content is exactly the same. Um, so don't worry if you don't have like a blue one on the one that's in your course. So, John, right, you don't, um, the, the template is not there, this guide is not necessarily there for you to edit. Um, 
you're going to be creating your own PowerPoint. It's more of a guide to walk you through what to include for each section. Um, and then also to make the links available to you. Cynthia likes the old template better. Well, <laughs> yeah, they, they, um, they sent it over right before Christmas. This was our Christmas present, a new, a new PowerPoint template. <laughs> All right, so um, you'll include a title slide. Like I said, you can use any kind of template you want. Um, this is not one of your critical elements, but this is going to help set you up for addressing uh, a lot of the critical elements in this first milestone. So um, include a brief overview of some major events in your time period. Thank you, Justine. So Chad, this one um, is not, this one wouldn't be a graph necessarily I mean you can use a graphic you know you can use like smart art or something it doesn't have to just be bullet points but it's not there's not on this particular slide there's not going to be a, a data presentation um, the data slides are coming up in a second um, well mark mark they they will um, generally unless you're talking about something that really has no economic impact like a famous pop singer who died or something. Um, but you know, like a war or um, you know, a natural disaster or something along those lines. Yeah, so the Berlin Wall would, would definitely, you know, be significant because that that had implications for um, lots of things, economy included. Um, so you might include a picture of the Berlin Wall, but that wouldn't be the only thing you would list here. You want to include kind of a, a few things that were important in your decade in terms of major events that might have had an economic impact or significance. So a recession is the economic impact, right, of possibly some events. Or it could just be cyclical, but yeah. So you'll get you'll get to talk about the recession specifically um, on the next slide. All right. So again, this isn't one of part of one of the graded elements, but helps support the graded elements coming up. Now this one is where you're going to include. A graph. Now, I don't have a graph here because this isn't an actual project. It's just telling you how to go about it. But we do have the links to where you can get some of this stuff. So the, um, the GDP portion of this uh, milestone has two critical elements. So the first is um, called gross domestic product and growth. So that means that you're going to need to show the GDP growth rate for each year of your decade. So it'll be... You can get this from Fred. We've got the link here. Um, it's going to be a, a line graph, typically speaking. If you get it from Fred, it will be a line graph. They use line graphs. not. Um, but if you were to create your own, it could be a bar graph um, with 10 data points. So GDP growth rate in 1980, GDP growth rate in 1981, 82, so on and so forth. So you're not, you're not doing um, the 10-year overall growth. Uh, you could certainly discuss that in your speaker notes, but what you need to show on the graph is the annual growth rate for every single year. Um, that's that's the sort of standard when we talk about growth rates and economics is to say, you know, the, the annual growth rate. That's the, the baseline number that we use. So Cynthia asks, so we're going to have 10 total graphs. No, Cynthia, so it's going to be a graph where on the, the x-axis, you're going to have years. So 1980, 81, 82, if you're doing 80s. And then on the y-axis is going to be um, percentages. And then you're just going to have, you know, kind of a connect the dots line. So if in 1980 the growth rate was, I'm going to say, I don't, I don't know what it was. <laughs> um, you know, let's, was that during the recession, Ellen, or was that right before? Um, let's say it was 2% GDP growth rate that year. You know, that would be 2%, and then 81, we had the recession. I might have to be a year off here, and then it's, you know, zero or slightly negative, and then comes back up. And a great year, it's something like 4%. 
So you'll see the line generally trend up, but with some dips or some plateaus. So Justine asks, can we use the graph provided by Fred or should we plot our own? Um, so you can use the graph provided by Fred, absolutely. The link here, so what happens when you go to Fred is that it brings you to GDP, but not GDP growth rate. Um, you can play around with the settings in Fred so that it shows annual growth rate instead of just showing the GDP. Um, not all students feel comfortable doing that. Um, like I said, we've got links to how to manipulate stuff like that in Fred. It's not tricky, but if you if that's just not kind of your uh, your your ball game, then you can take the GDP numbers that are there for each year and then calculate the growth rate yourself and put it in your own graph. That's, so that's entirely up to you how you want to go about it. So yeah, so Julie, um, this is this the GDP stuff is typically two slides. So one slide will have the graph, um, and I think it's a good idea to have some text on the graph just with a brief explanation of what we're seeing. So you know, maybe a bullet point or two. It doesn't actually have to be a bullet point, but you know, a sentence or two um, that that highlights some of the main things. Um, you know, if there was a big dip, you'd say, you wouldn't say it's a dip, right, in the graph, you'd use your economic terminology. You'd say there was a recession in this year, um, you know, it lasted this long, or there was an expansion in the economy over these years. So people can understand what the graph means. What does it mean when the, when the GDP growth rate line is going up steeply over these few years? Well, that's an economic expansion. What does it mean when the GDP growth rate line goes below zero? That's a recession. So you can explain that very briefly on the slide, and then your speaker notes are where you explain it in a little bit more detail. Yep, and of course you're going to cite everything. So whether you create your own graph or whether you take the graph and literally just like copy paste it from Fred, which you're totally allowed to do, you're going to have to cite it because either you got the data from Fred to make your own graph, or you took Fred's graph. But either way, you had to borrow something from somewhere. Um, so it will always be cited. Even Fred cites their graphs because they got the data from you know, the Bureau of Labor Statistics or Census Bureau or wherever they happen to get it from, depending on the data. Yes, exactly, Julie. Yep, just like the visuals in the textbook. Mm -hmm. So you'll, um, you'll have an in-text citation anywhere it's necessary. So a graph on the slide will need an in-text citation underneath it. Um, if you write a sentence on a slide that requires an in-text citation, make sure you have it there. And your speaker notes, your writing in your speaker notes is definitely going to need in-text citations. Um, if you're talking about any information or data that you had to get from an outside source. Um, the things that won't need citations are when you're doing a little bit of your own economic analysis um, or just talking about, ex like when you explain um, the graph, you know, what does a recession mean? Um, now that that's knowledge that you have, you don't necessarily have to cite it. But if you're talking about someone else's research or someone else's data, um, then you'll be citing it. So there'll be lots of citations here. That's the expectation. It's not a bad thing to have to cite someone else's work. It doesn't mean you're not doing things yourself necessarily. It just means that you're um, gathering information from appropriate sources. All right, so we've got a lot of links here, as you can see, um, a link to Fred for real GDP. And remember that real means adjusted for inflation. Um, the opposite of real would be nominal. So that's when it's not adjusted for inflation. So just be sure that you're looking at um, real data. Uh, we've got the link to calculate the growth rate if you choose to go about it that way. And we've got a link to sh introduce you to Fred. So this is um, a YouTube video. Um, yeah, June, if you want to email me, we can. Um, I'm, I'm happy to, to send you this, the new look. <laughs> I'm typing my email in the chat now. Yeah, so this will, this will be updated for next term, um, but we didn't get this in time for, for this term. So. And then the second element for GDP is asking you to choose two or three of the most relevant events from your time period 
that impacted the U.S. economy and apply specific models that we developed throughout the course to explain how these events had an impact on GDP. So, of course, a lot of you are probably saying we haven't studied all the models developed throughout the class. We're only in week two. And that is true. You are going to develop some more uh, sophisticated models for looking at this um, coming up. But for now, you can use the GDP formula as sort of your first model to think about this. So it's just a simple arithmetic formula um, that we were introduced to this week. But it, it's, it's pretty useful in terms of talking about this stuff. And we've got an example here to, um, to explain for you. Well, Chad, um, it's, you know, generally the, the economy has, with any 10-year time period almost, it's going to have some, some ups and downs. So if you can find just a, a couple of specific things um, that might have had an impact on GDP, it could even be something like, you know, uh, booming consumer confidence or the opposite, um, or it could be something along the lines of, well, trade we'll, we'll explore later, but I mean, we have the example here of, of military spending and, um, yeah, I'm trying to think of something off the top of my head, but it's past my bedtime, so. <laughs> um, I don't, I haven't found that students generally have a problem coming up with those things. Anything that affects investment, um, consumption, government spending, um, or net exports, is something you can talk to, speak to in this section. Yeah, tech bubble. That that's a that's a great one. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Yeah, well, we don't want this to be like a hundred page, a hundred slide long <laughs> um, presentation. So we just, you know, just a couple is fine to focus on. We just want to make sure that you understand. Um, the, the, econo the underlying economics and how events in the real world translate into things like GDP. And as you'll see coming up, inflation and unemployment. So how does, how does something out there happening in the world affect the economy or affect economic growth? Yeah, and I don't think there's any right or wrong picking two or three. I would just try to pick the ones that had the biggest impact. Um, so if you're looking at a bunch of things and you can say, well, this was probably pretty small compared to this, pick the one that had the bigger impact. Okay, yeah, or just like the invention of the internet, you know, the 50s. Um, the, the highway system put in, you know, those are things that had major economic impact. Yep. Okay, we are gonna move forward. I know we're already at time, but hopefully you guys can stick around to go through the next couple of slides. <laughs> Yeah, and, and we, um, we also have a great video that some of you might have already watched um, from our Shapiro Library folks. So Brian Rickman from the Shapiro Library joined us last week, and we just talked about um, how to use the Shapiro Library to search for some of this stuff instead of just using our Google diplomas. Yeah, so, so changes in policy can definitely um, be something to, to look at here. And you're also going to, we are going to look at policies, um, government policies specifically in upcoming slides. So I, I try to steer students to other kinds of events um, just so that you get a broader range of things that you get to look at. But those, of course, have an impact on the economy. All right. So let us move forward. So usually, actually, back up real quick. So usually this is two slides. So 
the first slide with the graph that we talked about, and then the second slide, again, um, the events and talking about the models and how that can show how an event impacted GDP. Uh, and you'll, this will be an example, the second portion of this will be an example where you might want to come back once we've developed a couple more models to, to look at GDP and how events um, can impact GDP and, and other macroeconomic data, um, you can beef up this section. So, you know, right now we have the GDP formula to use at our disposal. By week seven, you'll have, you'll have more tools in your toolbox, so to speak. All right, so the next um, portion is on unemployment and inflation. So these two macroeconomic uh, indicators together um, are, are lumped here together. So some students really like to spread it out. Um, there's two critical elements, but then there's two data sets that you're going to have to look at. Um, so some students like to have a slide for the unemployment data, and then another slide for the inflation data, and then another slide to talk about the second critical element, which is similar to what we just saw, looking at how the models that we develop in the course, how they explain, excuse me, um, the influence that the events had on unemployment and inflation. So you can break this up as much as you want. Um, don't, don't feel that you need to clump it all into one slide. So that's why we have two or more slides. Um, but we have links to unemployment and inflation uh, data. And so those are what these indices, um, the indices are. Inflation and then unemployment, find unemployment data here. The first two links up the very first bullet where it says analyze unemployment and inflation, those links take you to um, reviews of the concepts in the textbook. So that's... I believe there are videos um, straight from the textbook discussing, you know, what is unemployment and what is inflation uh, to give you a, a refresher. But that's all stuff we're covering this week. And then the data stuff is links are found down here. So Chad asks, if something significant happens prior to our 10-year time period that would affect the economy, should we mention and discuss it? Absolutely, yeah. Um, if it if it was proximate enough, I mean. For, like I gave the example of the highways. Obviously, we are still benefiting, our economy still benefits from the national highway system, right? But I don't think it would make a whole lot of sense for me to talk about it if I was talking about, um, you know, the 2010s, or, well, the 2010s isn't over, but I was talking about the past 10 years. Um, but you might want to talk about it if you're talking about the 60s, um, because I'm sure a lot of that project sort of, you know, might have overlapped with the 60s. Um, but, you know, we can talk about nowadays, you, you still might want to talk about the, um, the presence of the Internet and the effect that that has on the economy. The thing is, we don't see a big change because we've had the Internet, for instance, since if you're doing the last 10 years, we've had it that entire time. But you can talk about um, changes therein, let's say, so more people having Internet access, Internet access getting faster things like that. So even though the internet wasn't invented or didn't wasn't introduced in the past 10 years, you could still discuss it in some way. That's that's meaningful and relevant and timely. So um, Justine, yeah, this this might still link to you said it links to BLS. Um, you can find the same stuff from Fred. Oh no, I think I might have updated it. Um, if you cannot find um, yeah, if, if these aren't working well for you, all this stuff is available on FRED. So if you go to FRED um, and just type in where it says search and just type in unemployment, <laughs> it, it'll come up. Um, I think the code is unrate, but it, it'll, it'll come up right there for you. Just make sure that the data that you get is in a percentage. Um, same for inflation. So inflation, um, the easiest way to look at it, when usually when we discuss inflation, we discuss it not so much as where it is on the index, but the annual change so um, of, of the of prices. So you'll so when you hear people talk about inflation is two percent, um, that's what we want you to show here. So just make sure that you're you're getting that um, in your graph.
Yeah, so you'll have two separate graphs, uh, one for unemployment. So you'll have an unemployment rate number uh, for each of the 10 years in your decade. So it's going to be very similar to the GDP. Um, and then the same thing for inflation rates. And you can try to keep them on the same slide or you can put them on two different slides. That's entirely up to you. Um, but when you do share those, uh, those graphs, you'll also want to explain how inflation and unemployment are calculated for the data presented. Um, one of the things that we learned this week in the course is how unemployment is calculated and how we come up with these price um, indices and what they mean. So, and there's different price indices. Obviously, you know, we've linked to, um, to a couple specific ones here, but whichever one you pick, you want to make sure that that's, you're explaining how that one is put together. You know, typically it's some basket of goods and they have a certain way of going about that for that particular index. So you'll explain that, the index that you're using um, in your speaker notes. And for employment, you'll just explain the basics of how unemployment is calculated. So remember things like um, unemployment or employment in general only includes those people who are employed or looking for work. So uh, a full-time student who doesn't, isn't looking for a job wouldn't be considered unemployed even though they don't have a job. Um, a retired person wouldn't be considered unemployed um, even though they don't have a job. So that's just another way for you to show your understanding of, um, of, the, of our learning throughout the course. So make sure to include that in your speaker notes. That's, um, that's listed in the rubric, which is why we call it out here in the bullets. So Cynthia, you're gonna be, you're gonna be showing the data on a graph. Um, if you get it from these sites, you know, it'll already be as a rate, so you're not gonna be calculating it yourself. Um, if you go to like Fred, you know, like, like we've um, been talking about, you just get the unemployment rate and you're just gonna show it. But you're gonna explain what, it, what we mean when we say unemployment and what it means to calculate an unemployment rate in the speaker notes and the same with inflation. So you shouldn't have to do the calculations. Looks like somebody might be typing. Nope. Okay. Just want to make sure I don't miss a question about that. Right. I mean, in this in this day and age, um, we definitely want you to understand how these numbers are put together, because that that understanding is is important when when we talk about all this stuff and you know what does it mean for unemployment to be five percent what does it mean for inflation to be two percent um but at the same time calculating them on a regular basis isn't necessarily because we have all this stuff out here for us so understanding how the professionals arrive at these numbers is important but doing it yourself here um, isn't necessarily what we're looking for I mean, there definitely are some practice problems in your homework where you're going to have to do stuff like that for, you know, a, a pretend economy. Um, so you'll get some, some practice and that will hopefully help you under, remember and understand how the professionals come up with these numbers. Um, but yeah, we, we want to make sure that you're getting the, the real um, official statistics. So uh, the second graded element for um, unemployment and inflation section is asking you to apply specific models developed throughout the course um, to demonstrate how the events influence unemployment and inflation during this time period. So you'll notice here that one of the models mentioned is, it's, it's, is ADAS. Uh, we haven't covered that yet. So that's going to be something you can come back and include for the final draft. So this, this is definitely going to be one of those sections where um, a lot of students will be at proficient and then to move up to exemplary for the final project, um, we'll need some revision once we've covered some more of the macroeconomic models. All right, we've just got one more slide. Thank you guys for hanging on. The final draft is due in week seven. So remember, this is just a portion of your final project. So you're submitting this portion of it this week. 
um, you're submitting another portion of it in week four and another portion in week five. You're going to get feedback on all these sections, and then you're going to resubmit in week seven, everything all together. So Kim, like the GDP formula would be one. And you can use that even to explain some of the um, some of the things here. So when GDP is comprised of consumption, investment, uh, government spending, and net exports. So let's say consumption uh, goes down. So when consumption goes down, that means people are buying less, which means um, we don't need to produce as much, which means people we don't need as many people employed. So that would have an impact on um, on employment, for instance. Uh, we will get to some, like I said, some more developed models, like the aggregate demand, aggregate supply model, which is mentioned in the last bullet here, um, but that will be for the final draft of this section. So you'll, you'll be able to make edits to this section when you submit for week seven. But yeah, for now, if you just kind of think about um, the GDP formula and how that connects to inflation and unemployment, that should be enough to get you started for this, uh, for this milestone. All right, and our last slide. So this is on interest rates. This one is usually just one slide for um, most students. So just like with the others, this is our data portion. So we want to see a graph of interest rates for your 10-year time period. So every year, it's going to have an interest rate. <laughs> um, the one most students use is the federal funds rate. That's sort of the baseline rate that the Federal Reserve aims for, um, sort of set the basis for interbank lending and then moving up the, the chain to what you know commercial banks lend to regular people like us. <laughs> um, so that's, that's the lowest of them, um, typically, always. I don't want to speak out of turn, but... Um, so that's sort of the baseline. You could also include, we have the link here to three-month treasury rate, if that's what you want to use as your main indicator. Um, and if you want to include more than one, we could also look at the bank prime loan rate. So that's the one that's advertised maybe by like your local bank, what they put um, in their window. They might say prime plus however much. Um, so that's more like the, the commercial uh, rate that has more of an impact on things like car loans um, and mortgages. Julie, you don't need to include the three-month treasury rate. That's an example of one of the rates you could use here in this section. Like I said, most students use the federal funds rate because that's like the baseline. So if you're more comfortable with that, by all means, just use that one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the federal funds rate makes the most sense, but um, we included some other ones just in, in case students wanted to take a different angle, especially the bank prime loan rate. Um, there are some time periods where interest rates were really high. Uh, before my time or, or when I was very young, this was the case, you know, back in the 80s, um, the, the lending rates were, were so high that, you know, people couldn't, had difficulty taking out mortgages and buying cars. Um, so it might be useful to show just how high those rates were. So someone doing a decade like that, in order to sort of enhance their narrative, might want to show the bank prime loan rate. Um, so again, that's why we've included those links here. But the general one that students use that we would recommend is, is the federal funds rate because that's the baseline. Um, Carol asks, is this presentation available in print? Um, I mean, you have access to, like I said, this is just the new look with the new template, the new PowerPoint template, but all this stuff is available in your class and you're free to print it out if that's, um, if that's what, if I'm interpreting you correctly, Carol.
I think maybe I'm not though. <laughs> And Cynthia asks how long the speaker, speaker notes need to be. Um, generally, Cynthia, they're between one to two paragraphs. It depends on how much you have on the slide. If, if you spread out your slides more, um, so there's not a ton of information on each slide, your speaker notes will probably be shorter just because there's less to explain. Okay. Are you having a hard time finding where the guide is in the class? I, I can I can describe that again. I could even type out the steps in the chat if that helps. Yeah. So um, the only thing you really need to know about APA for this course, um, so Cynthia asked about APA, and then I'll I'll type in the the steps. Um, is your in-text citations are going to be in APA format? So when you've got the parentheses and then the author's last name, comma, the year of the publication. Um, end parentheses, and then the reference list will be in APA format. Um, so you'll want to follow those conventions. But PowerPoint itself doesn't really have APA. Like, there's no dictated uh, spacing, excuse me, spacing rules. There's no dictated font or font size like we have with a Word document. So the only things that we're really looking for in terms of APA are around citations. Hmm. Um, Carol, the template might be, gosh, how do I, it, it might be automatically downloading to your computer as a file. So the guide pops up, I think, that's the only thing I can think of. If you're having trouble, the help desk, I mean, I hate just sending students to the help desk, but because they can see what you're doing and, and then they can point you in the right direction. Um, Hmm. And um, if you're if you need a copy of the file and you can't get it, just email your instructor and they can they can email it to you directly. If the help desk doesn't work, because if there's something going on um, with the course, you know we should let the help desk know because it it might need to be fixed or you might continue to run into this problem. But in the meantime, if you need the file, your your instructor can help you out too. Good point, Rob. Thank you. Um, I don't know, Cynthia. Cynthia asks, is Google Slides okay? I don't know if you can submit Google Slides to the system. Um, everybody has access to the Microsoft Office Suite for free, so if you don't already have have it, you can um, you can get it for free as a student. That too. Yeah, so I would I would encourage against that just because it's it's a big unknown. We already have a lot of unknowns with the new learning management system. Let's, let's just keep it to a minimum. <laughs> So yeah, and if, if you have any trouble um, getting Office for free, uh, your advisors have a lot of experience setting that up for students, and again, the help desk, <laughs> they're, they're wonderful. <laughs> Just try to catch them when they're not getting too many calls. That way you don't have to wait too long on the phone. All right, so let's wrap it up here. So interest rates, just like all the, a lot of the other slides, you're going to have your graph. Um, you're going to explain briefly what you see. And in the speaker notes, you're kind of going to answer some of these questions that are listed here. Um, how would these fluctuations affect or be affected by inflation? Um, how would investments or foreign trade rates be affected? And how would the GDP of the American economy be affected? So some of you might be like, gosh, I don't know how to go about thinking about answering those questions. Well, this link right here, again, this is to our textbook. Um, takes you to a video within our textbook, but then you can also read more in that section. Um, it'll say what section it's from uh, by visiting there. So a lot of it helps explain the connection between um, interest rates and that GDP formula. So like when I when we were talking about uh, buying a car when interest rates are really high, 
it was very difficult for people to buy cars and get mortgages and spend money on their credit cards because um, interest rates were very high. So you can imagine the impact that had on consumption, which is part of GDP. And of course, even more so on investment. So businesses take out loans to invest, um, to build new manufacturing plants or to get more capital um, for their uh, for their facilities or to invest in new technologies. So when interest rates go up, that becomes more expensive for them. So we can understand how investment might go down when interest rates increase and vice versa. So again, all this is really based on that GDP formula that we're learning about this week. So these questions might seem intimidating at first, but you actually do have the tools to, um, to start chipping away at them. And Tammy mentions, think of speaker notes as you presenting your PowerPoint to a group. That's exactly right, Tammy. Um, and, and that's how a lot of people use them. Um, I tend to be more of a practice it in my head a lot instead of write it down. But the whole point of speaker notes is that when you're giving the presentation, you can have your speaker notes in front of you so you don't have to put all the information on the slide because that's not really the point of... Uh, of the slide deck. The slide deck itself that you show people is just supposed to have the basics, um, some important data or graphics or graphs like we're doing here, um, and then you say the rest to your audience in your talk. But we don't get to give a talk, which I'm sure some of you are probably happy about. You don't have to get up in front of a group and present this. <laughs> You'll get to practice that in, in other places in your life, no doubt. All right, are there any other questions about these elements, about the project in general, about where to find what you need? Oh, and I did promise you I would type in the chat how to get to the final project resource area. So you go to start here, and then assignment. Assignment, guidelines, and rubrics. Actually, before I start here, you have to go to content. I'm still, we're all still learning Brightspace. So if I really start at the beginning, it's course menu to learning modules to start here to assignment guidelines and rubrics. So there's the, the steps. So yeah, Chad, that, that's right. We're not, we're not analyzing too much at this point. You are explaining a little bit how, um, mostly because this is what we have at our disposal, how the GDP formula can explain, um, explain why some of this stuff is moving the way it is based on events that are happening in the world at that time. Um, but you're, more analysis is going to come further down the line, yeah, especially when we look at the fiscal and monetary policies, which are the focus of the next two milestones. All right, doesn't look like there's many other questions. So um, Cindy asks, is this information on the current template? So Cindy, just just a note. So there's um, an actual template, which is a little bit more blank for you to actually work in if you so choose. 